is a neo Ryan, he made a 3D painting, and Simeon Ackroyd, he made this painting over here. And we're just going to have a sort of chat, really, about um, Bernard Rocker and a little bit about Rudolf Rocker, um, who's Philip's grandfather, who's also a very interesting character. And yeah, and then we'll open to questions and feel free to ask questions throughout as well. Where is Rocker's? Has Rocker got a painting? It's right here. Yeah. That one? Above me, yeah. This is where you draw the platform. I thought platforms. they were done by the same artist. I thought one, one was experimental and one was kind of realistic. I didn't look at the, uh, I didn't look at the title. Oh, uh, so it's like this one. Oh, yeah. Just a different name. <laughs> I'm just going to begin with telling you a bit about Herman Rocker. Um, and he had a lot of jobs throughout his life. Um, he was a draftsman, a cartoon animator, commercial artist for a while, he was a book illustrator. Um, he worked for a while for the Oxford University Press in later life, and he had his first solo show in 1944 in New York, and since then showed at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Whitney Chicago Art Institute, uh, he's in a collection of the Library of Congress and Mick Jagger. Um, and he had a fascinating life. He was the son of an anarchist, um, Rudolf Rocker, who was a German Gentile who very much integrated into the Jewish community in Stepney before the First World War. And he learned Yiddish and he met his wife, who was a Ukrainian Jew called Millie Whitcock. And they were interned in Alexander Palace. Um, when the war broke out, and since then they moved around. And Furman was named after a Spanish a anarchist, and Mary of Cadiz, Furman Salvo Shade. Correct my pronunciation. <laughs> um, and so he grew up around many prominent anarchists: er Erico Malatesta, Peter Kropotkin, and he attended meetings growing up um, with his father and learned to draw with his half-brother, um, who I believe is also called Rudolf. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, at the outbreak of World War One, both parents or well, grandparents were uh, arrested and um, extradited to the Netherlands. Um, from the Netherlands they moved to Berlin, um, where Philip Rocker was educated as a lithographer. Um, so there he started sketching, doing watercolours, graphic works, and I think that continued throughout and affected the way he worked his whole life. Um, so again, I think I yeah. misinformed people. <laughs> in but um, from what I read about Philip Rocker, his working process was to um, have a work for a model if it was a portrait, or he'd, he'd make lots of sketches from a model, and he'd do a watercolour. And then he'd move on to make the oil painting, which is quite traditional and not so much, um, not so very common way of working anymore. Um, but that's the way he worked up until the very end. And he never stopped drawing and painting. And I think it was when he reached 65, is that right, that he dedicated himself to painting full time? Yeah. yeah. And. Yeah, I think it became inadvertently quite fashionable. <laughs> well, to an extent, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he was influenced very much by realism, and he was compared to Edward Hopper and Balthus. Um, his paintings aren't overtly political at all, apart from the one that Mick Jagger bought, which was about, which depicted vast refugees fleeing. Um, Franco's alley towards the French border. But apart from that, then they very much started landscapes, uh, lots of landscapes. And then after the move back to London in the 70s, um, became lots of depictions of everyday life. And he had 13 solo shows in the last 20 years of his life. Um, Can you, do you know how much Mick Jagger paid for that painting? £4,000. Only £4,000? Yeah. Yeah. That could be more than that. Yeah, probably you should take that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and <coughs> interestingly, um, he died the day after the show opened at the Michael Chambers. The day before. The day before, sorry. Um, the day before his show opened at the Michael Chambers Gallery. He attended the 
trafficking? No, no, he did didn't him? actually. He was, Michael was trying to get him to come to the He was really too old by that time. Okay. Where's that, New York? No, here. No, just in uh, Barbican. Barbican? Yeah. yeah. Michael yeah. Chambers? It doesn't exist anymore. Crossrail oh. has gone through it. So, um, uh -huh. yeah. In, but, uh, it's just, just opposite Smithfield Market on the corner of the beach. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I believe that was the launch exhibition. Yeah. yeah. And where you two met? Yes. <laughs> where well, you two met? Well, Sort of, yeah. So are you sitting on a fortune? Uh, well, I don't know. If anyone <laughs> wants to uh, <laughs> tell me about it all. I don't mean your, your uh, wife, yeah, I presume. Oh, yeah. I, meant, I meant your uh, family's <laughs> painting. Um, uh, well, I don't know. I, mean, I wouldn't quite say a fortune, but uh, there know. are a lot of them. There are a lot of them, but I don't know. Um, really, you know. Um, <laughs> but so you uh, met the no, we didn't actually meet. We met before that, but uh, you know, started working for, for Michael actually some well, actually after that. But we, we did go to the to that show together. Um, so it was sort of So it started yeah. going out. <laughs> What's this? It started going out on this day. <laughs> on the day that from Yeah. And you're somewhat of a um, yeah, the daughter came, uh, became an expert, and uh, it was um, uh, Michael Chambers. Maybe who knows the legal world? They know Chambers legal publishers, Chambers uh, directories, Chambers books. Well, it's a very, very well known legal publishing house, legal publishing house, Chambers, and. Um, his hobby, yeah, he's a very, very successful self-made businessman, and his hobby is social realism and socialist realism. As a few of quite well-known uh, multimillionaires, he believes that the best, uh, that socialism probably was the best um, social system that the world lost, which is paradoxical because he's a capitalist. <laughs> And um, uh, so, in a way, you know, he's uh, Furman's art and uh, Soviet art of, Soviet, of uh, socialist uh, era uh, reflected uh, his views. And uh, I worked for the Academy of Arts of Russia of the USSR. I was deputy director for the museum of the Academy of Arts of the USSR in Russia. And uh, he employed me as an um, art specialist, uh, as a consultant for the gallery. I was writing catalogues, and um, surely I was organizing shows of uh, Fermin. So after the uh, first one, I organized two shows. And the last one was um, Ben Shan and um, Ameri American Social Realism. And uh, as soon as uh, Furman Rocco was part of it, uh, his works were included in this show. That's it. Thank you. Um, is, is that the equivalent of the Royal Academy in London, that's a uh, Russian Academy? It was bigger in a way that... Um, it should be bigger, shouldn't it? It is. <laughs> it is. It is, it's everything. The thing is that it was like a ministry of culture in a way, right. you know, in arts, because it was it was a big institution uh, which um, had uh, two research institutions, one museum, uh, two high schools, and fifteen um, uh, colleges in fifteen republics. So uh, the official governmental views were imposed by the academy when I joined it. Um, it was already in it is when it was you know socialism. This was the last day of socialism, and probably that's why I got my position because I was very young and nobody wanted to do this job because they realized that socialism is all wrong <laughs> and they have to think about their future <laughs> and just run away from the socialist saying in the academy, you know. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have a socialist. Uh,
aspects to them. I think very clearly. You mentioned earlier that anarchism is dead. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and I was one of saying, oh, it's still kind of live and kicking up in the higher east end at the moment. So the legacy is continuing. And, and your father, you have maintained some anarchist. Well, he had sort of sympathies, yeah. I mean, he certainly wasn't political, really, in, in that sense. I mean, when he was, he was growing up, like you said, sort of surrounded by sort of, you know, anarchists and, you know, various revolutionary characters, mainly coming out of Russia. Um, you know, so it was, um, you know, very, um, you know, it was very much the kind of atmosphere. And he, he did, I mean, he only knew people as a child that, you know, Kropotkin uh, used to, didn't actually, I don't know if you were so much friends with meetings, but my uh, uh, grandparents' house in Stepney was, was very much sort of open house, and there'd just be people coming through all the, the time. So it was, um, so, yeah, that was the run up to the First World War, really. Um, so they were, like, um, my, my grandfather, you know, he said, he taught himself Yiddish, and he, he Kind of made himself a kind of a leader of the you know Jewish textile workers and um, so he organized. Did he know Zangwill? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I don't watch. Uh, uh, Zangwill, you know that political agitator. Yeah. He sent juries. Well, I think my grandmother died when I was one, uh, and my grandfather when I was three. But my grandfather, I remember him. But the thing is, we, I mean, he, um, you know, they, my dad grew up in East End, and then uh, he was, um, you know, my grandfather was in turn as a German. My grandmother wasn't in turn. My grandmother only got herself locked up because um, as the war went on, the British um, decided to help out the Tsar by saying that Jewish men in the East End either had to join the British Army or be eligible conscription, or else they can go back to Russia and fight for the Tsar. So there was an agitation against that. My grandmother was very busy agitating against that. So she got herself put in uh, Aylesbury and um, sort of, it was only for the last couple of years of the war. And then at the end of the war, they did a deal with the Germans to repatriate basically civilians. It was actually before the, the revolution in, in Germany. So it was a bit hairy because if they'd been sent back while the Kaiser was still in charge, it wouldn't have been terribly good for my grandfather. But uh, so they stopped off in Holland, sort of jumped ship there and stayed for a few months. And then after that, they moved to Berlin. They, they so he was in Berlin up until 1929, and because um, my grandfather was, I mean, he's well known within a fairly small circle. So he'd been invited on lecture tours around America a couple of times, and my dad accompanied him on a, like a couple that. So in 29 he went, and my grandfather returned to Germany, but uh, Fermin stayed on in New York, basically, and uh, it was the Depression, and so he, he thought, I mean, things were bad everywhere, but probably even worse in Germany than in, in the States, so um, he managed to get a job at, uh, at Fleischer's where they did Betty Boop and I mm -hmm. was going back away. So he only, he only did the backgrounds and things for the cartoons, but he uh, sort of managed to scrape by as a sort of commercial artist and a um, you know, photographer. And, um, he never really, um, I mean, he was growing up in you know, sort of Weimar, Berlin, which you'd think would be, um, you know, sort of, you know, all full of, uh, you know, excitement for him, but actually he really didn't fit into the uh, sort of Weimar art scene very much. You know, they were a bit um, detached from that. So, you know, people like George Gross and various, they, he didn't really, I mean, he kind of knew very peripherally, but not, he didn't really have any very close relationship. There was a certain Kathy Colwitz, I don't know. What's her name? Kate Colwitz. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Kathy Colwitz. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, who my dad, Kind of admired probably more than any other German artist of the, um, of the time. 